I'm so happy to be here and honored to introduce to you two world famous thinkers. Dr. Adizis from Adizis Institute and Geshe Michael Roach from Diamond Cutter Institute. First time together who will talk today about their lives, their works and methodologies. Uh, it seems to me that today we will have very, very bright insight why two of those people very successful in the business, why two of those people very successful in families, and why two of those people are very successful and interesting around the world, why people come into those programs, and how those programs and methodologies helping to change this world. Hello, gentlemen. Are you ready? Yes, thank you. So excited. Would you like to begin? Yes. Uh, Dr. Dizis, if I could ask you a question. And first of all, thank you very much for agreeing to do this uh, interview. And I'm very honored to be able to talk to you. And I hope to learn a lot from you uh, during this interview. I guess the first question I would have is, uh, I'm interested in how you got started in this work of advising companies and governments around the world. I, I wondered, you know, how did it first happen that you started to advise companies and governments? And then secondly, I think, uh, did you have some master goal in mind? Did you have some large goal in your own mind that after you had advised these companies and governments that what would you like to see happen with those governments and companies? And in my own case, uh, the way I got started in this business was that uh, I, I spent, I don't know, 25 years in Tibetan monasteries. Uh, I was quite happy. I was contented. And uh, then one of my main teacher encouraged me to start a business and said that uh, if I just stayed in the monastery my whole life, I wouldn't really meet normal people. I wouldn't learn about the problems of normal people. And I couldn't change uh, the condition of normal people. And then, uh, so he encouraged me to start a business in Manhattan. And we started a diamond jewelry company. And um, of course, it, it got very big. It became the largest diamond jewelry company in the world. And we sold it to Warren Buffett in 2009. And uh, sort of my goal in my mind was, uh, can I transfer this ancient knowledge of the Tibetan monasteries into real life, into modern life? And can I make people's lives better by using this ancient wisdom? So I wonder, Dr. Adizis, how, how you got started and, and what were you thinking you would like to achieve? Thank you, Michael. I'm also honored to be with you. I, I... I'm at the stage of my life when I'm looking for people that are spiritually enriching me because there's so much to learn and so much to grow. I'm ready to learn from you as well. I already read your book, so I'm ready to learn more beyond the books. So, haunted by, by failing. I was a professor at UCLA in the School of Management and visiting professor at Columbia and at Stanford. I was somewhat known and I was lecturing in executive programs. And then some executives came and said, why don't you apply what you're teaching and help us in our company? So I went and studied the subject. I looked at the books and I wrote a report I was very proud of. And then nothing happened. I was really very depressed. Especially because I was consulting to what I thought or was considered the smartest man in the world, in the United States, maybe. Yeah. Rob Bob Hutchins, the president of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, who at the age of 23 was elected by his professors at Yale School as their dean. And at the age of 28, he was the president of the University of Chicago. At the age of 76, he was dying from leukemia. The center was going to die because it all depended on him. So I told him, let me give you some consulting what to do so the he said does not die. And I wrote a report and I was right. It actually died because it did not do anything. And he told me, I agree with you. And I absolutely agree with every word you say. So what happened? So I tried another company and another company. And then when I talked to McKinsey guys, 
He told me laughingly, welcome to the club. 95% of what we recommend does not get implemented. Or it gets implemented, we recommend the horse and they implement the camera. <laughs> wow. Wow. Then I looked at the business school program and to my shock, there is no one course on change, implementation. It's all on decision making. But how do you implement your decisions? Not one course. Not at Columbia, not at Stanford, not at UCLA, not at Tel Aviv University. None of the universities. Because they are assuming erroneously, if I make a good decision, it will be implemented. <laughs> Not true. We implement bad decisions. We smoke, we overdrink. We don't implement good decisions. What's going on? So I quit the university, gave up my tenure. I had a wife and two children, jumped into the real world, and they realized none of the books can help me. I have to create something with my own hands. And I just, this is called in medicine, evidence-based science. I developed it by just failing, finding a solution, trying it again until it works, until it works, until it works. And then I documented it. And then to be sure that it is not just me, but there is a methodology. I trained my associates all over the world and monitor to see that it works with them as well. Now I knew I have a repetitive so-called scientific methodology because it could be repeated. What was my goal? Curiosity. I wanted to learn how do you make change happen? How do people change? And over the 50 years, I succeeded to develop the methodology for company. But when I go into the government, change. I'm not the government, unless it's a dictatorship. <laughs> and in a democratic society, they all agree with me. They say, wonderful, you're absolutely right, you're a genius, and then nothing happens. <laughs> so I now have to develop a new methodology for macro systems, except that I'm running out of time because I'm going to be 80 next month. Wow. And got interested. How do you change people? And then I found out that I can change marriages. In other words, I can save marriages. And my last book is not to apply the methodology for marriage. And I'm looking for how does it apply to a human being? So the whole thing is still learning. I'm still learning. So what's my personal goal? To live long enough to learn more. That's <laughs> okay. Now, my question to you is, how do you feel when people call you a guru, in my case, I try not to hear it. I try to ignore it. I don't let it go to my head. Because honestly, Michael, honestly, everything I created, I feel it's not me. It's really not me. Because many times you find a solution waking up in the morning. I wake up in the morning and say, aha, where did this aha come from? <laughs> I didn't do any research. I didn't do any controlled experiments. I did not read it in the book. Where did this creativity come from? I think it comes from me having no fear to listen. No fear to listen. No fear to say what I hear and what I feel and what I think. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I think my success is having no fear. And that makes me ask a question. What do you feel when you're a guru? And how do you control your ego? Okay, good question. Uh, you know, we just finished uh, developing a course which we're going to release in Europe uh, this week. And it's, called, it's about creativity and innovation. And it, it sort of depends on an, an ancient idea that I use to train people. And I'll, I'll do it for maybe two minutes. Uh, we take a thing like a pen. This is an ancient demonstration that was used uh, in uh, the third century, fourth century. And uh, they will take a pen and they will ask people questions. They'll say, what is this thing? And then they'll say, oh, it's a, it's a pen. And then they'll ask you, if a dog came in here and I, and I showed this thing to a dog, what would they do with it? And then we say, oh, the dog would, would chew this thing. And then the next question they ask us is, uh, 
So who's correct? Uh, is it a pen or is it a chew toy? Is the human right or the dog is right? And then, of course, we say, oh, both the human and the dog are correct. And then the teacher will ask us the question, if I leave the pen on the table and all the dogs go out of the room and all the people go out of the room, well, then is it a pen or a chew toy? And then we have to say, oh, at that time, it's not anything yet. It just depends on who walks into the room first. If the dog comes in, it will become a chew toy. If the human comes in, it will become a pen. And so then the next question our teacher will ask us is, well, does that mean the, the pen is coming from you or the pen is coming from the pen? And we'll think about it for a minute. We'll say, well, I guess it means the pen is coming from me because when the dog looks at it, uh, they see something different. And then the teacher will say, well, why, why does a pen come from you? You know, what's happening? And then they'll teach us that there are seeds in our mind. And uh, those are called karma in the ancient language, but really the, the word is very misunderstood, I think. So karma means uh, seeds inside the mind that are put there by how I treat other people. If I treat other people well, I will put good seeds in my mind. If I treat other people badly, I will put bad seeds in my mind. And then when those seeds open, I might see a pen. Uh, so when the seed opens, a small image comes out of my mind, it, and then it goes onto this object, and I see a pen. And the, in the dog's mind, there are also seeds, and when those seeds open, they come out, and this image comes out and, and makes this into a chew toy, and they start, their mouth starts watering. So then, you know, our whole management system is based on that. And the question is, how can you apply it to creativity? And, and what they would say is that even the ideas that you get in your mind, ideas that pop into your mind in the morning, you wake up with a new idea, like Dr. Adesis, you do almost every day, I think, that according to this system, it would be because you have seeds in your mind. Uh, when they open, then new creative ideas uh, come into your mind uh, from those seeds. And they would say that those seeds are planted in your mind by helping other people to be creative, and especially by uh, congratulating or celebrating other people's creative success. So if I would like to be a more creative person, then the method would be to, when I see someone else be creative, or when I see someone else come up with a new innovation, that I would be happy for them and congratulate them rather than being jealous, which is my natural reaction, or most of us. So this would be uh, the way to plant a seed in your mind for creativity, would be to encourage other people or to congratulate other people when they are very creative. So that leads into my next question for you, Dr. Desus. Like, I, I think all of us who, who are on stages a lot, and we're, we're often talking to people, thousands of people, and there's this natural tendency to be, I don't know, uh, to, to get a big head and, and to get caught up in, as you said, being a, a management guru, or I'm, the, I'm an important person, or people are listening to me. Uh, as, a, as a management teacher and as a person, uh, how do you deal with that, and how do, you, how do you prevent that kind of thinking? I think it's a big obstacle to people like you and I who, who do this kind of work. How do you keep yourself real, and how do you keep yourself from, from getting big delusions of grandeur about who you are and how much attention you get, and things like that? Uh, 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 that is a great question. Let me start with a pen, too. I lose a pen also in my lecture, but differently. Now let me show you how different it is and leads me to answer your question. I ask him, what is this? People say pen. Okay. What do you use it for? Why do you call it a pen? Why don't you call it a, a head scratcher? <laughs> you can keep your hand with it. Well, because you need to write. Ah, so what it is is what it does, what it does. Now, I can use it for scratching a hand, still not good enough. 
It's still a plan. It's not what it does. What is it? What is the purpose of the pen? Why was it created? It was created with the purpose in mind. Now, please look around, they say. Look around. Just don't, don't look on my pen only. Look around. Look at the house. Look at the lights. Look at the table. Look at anything. It has a purpose. It was created for a purpose. And you also have a purpose. Maybe you don't know what your purpose is, and that's why you're frustrated. Once you know your purpose, you find your way in life. What is your purpose? Now, let me tell you what the purpose should be. Look at the pen. It doesn't exist in itself. It reads to write. Look at the table. What does it exist? To hold your material. Look at the light that exists to lead the room. We all exist for somebody else. So my question to you is, for whom do you exist? Not why do you exist. For whom do you exist? Don't tell me for yourself, because that is a cancer. Look at the heart. Heart exists for the rest of the body. The lungs exist for the rest of the body. The only part of the body that exists for itself, which is for death, is cancer. Are you cancerous or are you alive? How will you serve others is your purpose. So when you ask me how I keep myself in line, not to get my head too overblown, <laughs> is by always taking cases where I'm going to fail. More difficult cases. When tell me somebody, there's an organization that is hopeless, I say, <laughs> give, it. give it to me. I take governments when I know I'm going to die there. <laughs> you know what? The more I know, the more ignorant I am. Because the more I know how much I don't know. <laughs> it me, keeps me down to the ground. My question to you is, what is God for you? It preoccupies me a lot. Not because I'm close to the last station in life. But because, very interesting, Michael, I had emerged by, from looking at companies, because I found out what makes a company successful is integration. The more integrated is like a diamond. Why is a diamond the strongest stone ever? Because the most integrated thing. It's the hardest thing that exists, integrated. So integration. But then I said, okay, I started realizing it's not only internal integration. It has to be integrated with the community and the society in which it operates. How well does it serve the society beyond economically producing products? But then I realized, wait a moment. It is more than a society. It is a globe. And then I started to say, wait a moment. Integration is really with God. Because what is my purpose in life? My purpose in life is love. To love and to be loved. But what is love? What is absolute love is God for me. What is absolute love? Absolute integration. What does it mean? So I developed a whole theory for me. What is God? I would like to know what you think is God. Uh, I'll tell you what I think. God, bottom line is because I was invited to a lecture to 200 Catholic priests <laughs> about what is God. A Jew to tell them what is God. I mean, that was the but I took the challenge because I like to fail. I like to go into uncharted territory and see what happens. And I told them, in my judgment, God is not some entity with a long beard sitting up there looking at us and telling us what to do. It's not even nature. No, it's not. It is an algorithm of an operating system that is guiding everything. And we are all, everything you see is an application of that algorithm. Trees and people and everything you see, application of the algorithm. And the algorithm is love. And what is love? Integration. And what is integration? Mutual trust and respect. When we don't respect our environment, when we break the trust of the environment of us, we are, that's what we are doing. The algorithm doesn't work. Like you might, you violate the computer, the computer breaks down. That is ill. God is not punishing us. 
we are creating Irma by disrespecting the world in which we live. So it is really an algorithm. So worshiping God is mean creating as much trust and much as much mutual trust and respect you can create. And that's my next stage in goal in life. What is yours? Uh, I think a lot about God and I, I like, uh, there's a, there's an ancient Buddhist idea of, uh, you know, what is God or what is an enlightened being. And uh, they say it has four parts. And a lot of what I teach for businesses or, or government entities, it it's, comes from this training that I had. And I, I like to take ideas that I learned uh, during my time in the monastery, and I like to try to apply them to modern life or to modern companies, modern businesses. So as far as God, uh, they have this interesting idea that God has four parts. And uh, I like it. So the, the easiest part of the four parts is, is God, where God lives. Uh, if God is living in heaven or God is living in their own enlightened place that we can't see, um, so they have a body. They would say an enlightened person has a, a body in that heaven or in that paradise. So that's the first of the four parts of God. The second of the four parts is the, the part of God that God shows to normal people or to shows in the world. And this could be as a person uh, or it could even be as the sound of the ocean or the sound of the trees or, or even your your favorite pet, uh, we, we, believe, we believe that one part of God is that they can show, uh, appear in this world as different people and different things. The third part of God is um, the way God thinks, and, and we think God can see everything, and God knows all things in the world, uh, past, present, and future, that for them, in one moment, uh, Everything is present. They can, they can see all things. They can see all people, all living creatures in all worlds. And then the, I think the most interesting part of God is that uh, they say God is like the pen. And, uh, and what it means is the pen itself is like a blank, white movie screen. It has a certain quality about it that it's available to be different things. You can see it as a pen. Uh, you can see it as a chew toy. And so its deepest nature, perhaps, is that it's like a movie screen. Depending on how you've been treating other people, uh, you will see the pen as a pen, or you will see this as a chew toy. And they say that this is the deepest part of God, is, is that God is also available to be seen in different ways, uh, depending on, on your state of mind and depending on what seeds you put in your mind, then you will see this being uh, God in, in many different ways and just depends on how good you are to other people. So I like your idea that, of integration. And I think uh, the ancient teachings of Asia would say the same thing, that, that there's, a, there's a connection and integration between how we behave, and then how we experience God and, and, and what God is to us. So that sort of brings me to my next uh, question. I think, you know, we both, we both have the same work. We both uh, try to advise uh, business people. Uh, and I think one of the most common questions I get, and I'm sure you get the same question, is that we meet business people who are stressed out, they, they never feel like they have enough time. The English word business comes from busyness, <clears throat> and it just seems like a lot of business people, they get very busy, uh, they work very hard, uh, they love what they do, but then oftentimes uh, we have trouble balancing it with our family life, uh, with our personal life. <clears throat> what ways have you found in your life to stay more balanced in your own life. Uh, you're very successful. You've, you've always got 100 projects to do. Many people are asking you for help. 
all of those projects are very exciting. Uh, you've had a successful family. And how did you balance uh, your family life and your business life? And how do you help p other people to do that? Well, I would love to answer that question because it's very cool for me as well. I'm not saying that I'm very successful in applying what I'm going to say now, but I'm working hard to do it. It's very cool that other people apply what they suggest much better than I do. But I'm proud. You see, the normal way, which means the prevalent way that people behave, first they work. They work. If there is any time left, they will give to the family. If there is any time left, they will give for themselves. <laughs> it's upside down. It is upside down. And what I did, here's what I did with an executive who is very successful. The company is, is in the list of the 500 richest people in the world. When we started, it was only $200 million. And now it's in the billions. And he was working very, very hard. Even got the divorce from the first wife. So I said to him, okay, let me tell you what we should do. I really got it from Peter Drucker who said, if you cannot manage your time, you cannot manage anything. So we have to manage time. Open the calendar. Let's start. How much time? You have to start with yourself. You first hold yourself. That's why meditation is so important. I recommend to all my clients, meditate. If you don't give some time for yourself, you will lose yourself. Meditate. It's half an hour a day. It's not such a big deal. So first start with yourself. Time for yourself. How much time are you giving to yourself? Whether it's half an hour a day, whether it's one weekend you want to spend just with yourself, going to some lake and looking at the nature, looking at the sunset. Time for yourself. Put it in the calendar. Start that. Allocate time for that. Next, time for the family. You see, I'm starting from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Time for the family. I say, you should have at least, you tell me, how about at least one dinner a week with my whole family? At least. <laughs> Put it in the calendar. Now, for the whole year. And one weekend, I'm not going to work, I'm going to with my family. I say, good, but that's not good enough. Because if you have children, taking them all together is not good enough. <laughs> one child at a time. Go for, a, you know, for one day. It's you and me alone. You and me alone. You and me alone. Then you and me with a wife alone. And I learned this from a client of mine. I was scheduling my whole year with him. And when I told him, I don't know, 15th of March, he said, sorry, Richard, I cannot do it. I'm on my honeymoon. <laughs> I just had a dinner with his wife the night before. <laughs> he goes and remarried overnight in California, but hey, that's too much. <laughs> and he realized I was kind of a surprise. And he said, you don't understand. It's my, it's my wife. Because every year on our anniversary, we have another honeymoon. Because one honeymoon is not enough for a lifetime. <laughs> Wow. So he, I said, do it. Every month, you're going to have a date with your wife. Every month, you're going to take a weekend and go somewhere. Religiously. Cannot be violated. It's like a board of directors meeting. Cannot be violated. <laughs> now, we say, now we go to the next. What are you going to do with the company? How much of the time are you going to spend on doing? How much time are you spend on administering? How much time are you going to spend on creating? How much time are you going to spend on integrating the people? To so start with integration, then on creation, then on administration, then doing. Let other people go. You're a CEO. You should not be doing. You should not be even administering. Your job is creating and integrating. Put it in the calendar. We actually fill the calendar for the whole year. Would you believe it? Wow. And now living that religiously. He's actually taking three months off every year to go with his yacht to the Mediterranean, spending <laughs> it will not work. So I think it is time management. You have to open your calendar and schedule what you're going to spend your time. Otherwise, the problems are managing you, 
you are not managing the problems. Mm -hmm. Now my question to you is, it preoccupies me because of my last, last book on the power of opposites and how to manage a family effectively, because the divorce rate is very high. People, you know, families are falling apart, and those that are not falling apart are living together. They're really not, it's not a loving family we all should be. So I'm asking myself, when should people get divorced? When is it over? When is it enough is enough? When is it not enough and you have to continue? And what does it mean to continue? So how do you answer that question? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, I can think back with, I have three brothers. And uh, my brother used to tell me, uh, you shouldn't give up on something until you can do it successfully and then you can give it up. You see what I mean? So uh, he would tell me, uh, you shouldn't quit something in the middle of a problem, even a business problem. If you have a, if you have a really bad business problem, uh, I think first you should uh, overcome it. And, and then you can divorce your business partner or you, you could split from your other uh, commitments. But I think the, the first thing is to prove to yourself that you can fix it and that you have the power to do that. Uh, sure. Even if you decide in the long run that you don't want to continue a relationship in business or a personal relationship, I think there's some kind of big power, my brother used to tell me, that you just... First you face the problem and you solve the problem. Then if you decide not to stay with that business relationship or why personal would, relationship. Why would you, that, you solve the problem? Why would you, why would you get divorced? Well, that's <laughs> what happens. I think if you solve it, then you don't have to get divorced, right? So I, I think uh, <clears throat> in, in this ancient system of uh, what you do to others is, will come back to you. I think we put a lot of emphasis on for example, if I was having a, a business problem with a, with a business partner, then, in, you know, that begins to obsess me. That, that begins to fill up uh, my evening. All day long, I'm thinking about this problem I have. And in the evening, when I go to sleep, I can't sleep because I'm thinking about this problem I have with this person in my business. And then it becomes a little bit of an obsession uh, with my problem. And according to the ancient idea, uh, you can solve a, a problem with a person by helping a friend of yours uh, to solve a problem with another person. That plants a seed in your mind that your own problem gets solved. So it's a very difficult thing to do when, when you're having a problem with another person, uh, either in business or at home, uh, you tend to focus on your own problems. And the worse the problem gets, then the more focus you will give to, to solving my problem. And the idea that they teach us in the monastery is that, like, if I have a problem that someone is being angry with me all the time in my business, for example, or my wife, then they would say, uh, then try to find someone else who has a similar problem. So in that case, uh, we can only solve a problem for ourselves if we help someone else to solve the, a similar problem. So in that case, I would try to find somebody else in my life who's having a serious problem with their, their, their spouse is getting angry all the time or they're having fights with their business partner. I would try to find someone like that. And then they say once a week for one hour, uh, try to take them out, uh, try to talk with them and help them to solve their problem. And then when you hear yourself talking, when you see yourself moving, uh, this is recorded in your mind. Uh, and this plants as seeds in your mind. So instead of focusing on yourself, uh, you focus on somebody else when you have a problem. You help them to solve their problem. And then you plant seeds in your mind to solve your problem. Then I had another person say, well, uh, if I'm focusing on someone else having a problem that I'm having, then I'm the worst person in the world to give advice to them because I have the same problem, you know. So I, I wonder, Dr. Deezus, uh, 
what would you tell someone like that? You know, first of all, you say, try to be more interested in other people's problems. Try to help other people more who have problems. And then they say, no, I, I can't do that because I have the same problem. That's not a good way to fix my problem because I have the same problem. What, what would you say to this kind of person? It's wrong. You know something? Look, have you ever noticed that if you, walk, if you look at people playing chess, you know better than the, play, than the guy playing chess. The kid itself sees moves much better. So if you, I find out the same thing in consulting. Somehow I can consult pro on problems that my client has that I cannot solve myself. <laughs> I even say in my lectures, I can reorganize governments. I move 250,000 people around. I restructure governments with my hands tied behind my back. My own institute, 50 people, I suffer, suffer on, on the cross. <laughs> Why is that true? Why is that true? Why is it true? It is true because when you know too much, you don't know enough. You know too much and you're emotionally involved. When you do it for somebody else, you don't know enough. You can see the problem from much higher. You can see the contours of the problem. When you're doing it yourself, you, it is, it is, you're overwhelmed. You cannot do it. Then you can do it because you have limited amount of information. And you're not emotionally involved. Mm. But you can think more rationally. And as you now solve their problem, you say, wait a moment, it's applicable. <laughs> you see, so your solution is a very good one. I think I learned something. Thank you. That was okay. worthwhile. Just that. Okay. And now my, my approach to, 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 to that subject is when I try to help a couple, because now that I'm working with this, this is a methodology for marriage, my guideline is if there is still some mutual trust and respect, there is still capability to continue. When there is no more trust and respect, it's over. Now, what does it mean, no trust and respect? I want to interpret that because it's not empty words. Respect means that you value the differences that the other person contributes. It means you're still learning. You learn something from the other person. You ask them, what do you think? And you learn from the differences. You don't reject the differences. That's respect. That's not me. It is really uh, Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant said, respect is when you recognize the sovereignty of the other person to think differently. Mm. And, and trust, my heart, trust is when you a faith that the other person has your interest at heart. Then when there is mutual trust, I, be, I, trust, I believe in your interest, you believe in my interest, we have common interest. And I want to learn from you, and you want to learn from me. If there is still mutual trust and respect, there is future. If I don't want to hear from you, I can't understand you. I don't trust you. I don't trust you. I cannot turn my back to you. How to call the lawyers, it's time to say goodbye. <laughs> that is my direction. Okay. Your time, your turn to ask a question. Um, I think, uh, I, I, would, I would get a lot of people that ask me questions about employees. Uh, they, they know that I was in a Buddhist monastery. Uh, they believe uh, that I was trained in these concepts of compassion and love. And then they ask me, uh, I have a company. Uh, the company maybe is going through a, a hard financial period. Uh, or else I have employees who are not producing. They're not, uh, they're not really working as well as I would like to do. They're not performing. So they will ask me a question. They will say, of course, you would tell me that if the company's not doing well, still I should not fire these people. I should, I should keep them in my company. I should be compassionate. Uh, I should keep paying them, uh, even if the company's not doing well. And the same thing with employees who are not performing. Uh, I have these employees who, who are not working hard. They're not 
doing uh, what I hired them to do. And, but you, Geshe Michael, you come from this tradition, uh, ancient tradition of compassion. I'm assuming you would say that, you know, I should keep those people and I should, I should keep uh, supporting them. And then my answer to that kind of person is uh, if they are hurting the performance of the company, uh, if they are not contributing to the performance of the company, then actually they're hurting everyone else in the company. So the more people you have in the company, if you just blindly, if you say compassion means uh, just keep them, whether or not they're performing, uh, whether or not they're helping the company, and even when the company doesn't have enough money to keep these people, if that's compassion, then the, you're going to lose the company. And, and that's not compassionate either to all the other people who are working hard. So what do you think is the right thing to do, either when the company uh, doesn't have the finances to keep all the people you would like to keep, or you're not really satisfied with the performance of people, even who've been there a long time, uh, they've stopped performing. Uh, what would you tell that company or owner? What is a compassionate thing to do and what's a right thing to do? And is the right thing always compassionate? Look at my hand. <laughs> what you say, it's your problem, you're not performing, you're not doing very well. One finger is pointing at you. <laughs> One finger is pointing at God. There were changes in the market, there were changes in the technology, uncontrollable. Hey, it's not his fault, something came from uncontrollable. And three fingers are pointing at home, at you. Your mission is wrong, your strategy is wrong, your plans are wrong, your compensation system is wrong, information is not flowing right, your organization structure is not right. What do you want from them? They're not the villain, they're the victims. <laughs> you know who the problem is? You. <laughs> you, these three figures. After you do all of this right, they are still not performing. I think you're absolutely right. You're not doing it. Time for them to leave because you're destroying the other one. You know, that, then they're cancerous. But it's premature to fire them because they're not performing, because maybe it's not their problem. Mm. Maybe they're the victim, not the, not the villain. Mm. So, what are you doing to make the company to operate right? Now, I also tell them a business methodology is not consulting. Actually, we are not consultants, we are organizational healers, we heal organizations. We do not recommend firing. As a matter of fact, in 50 years that I worked, we worked with thousands of companies, hardly anybody got fired. Somebody resigned because they did not like the new participative system. It was not to their liking. But we did not fire people in order to increase effectiveness and efficiency. We convert fat into muscle. <laughs> That's good. Liposuction. We don't do liposuction. <laughs> we focus on how to increase revenue, not how to cut costs. Ah, uh, good, yeah. yeah. And this is a major change. It is how to improve the muscles of the organization, how to make the people perform, which means to create an environment in which they can perform. <laughs> That's the difference. So I don't let the CEO get away with this. I don't talk about compassion. I don't talk about anything. I really talk about profitability. You want to be profitable? Do the job. Do what needs to be done to be profitable. It is not their problem, your problem. There are no bad joy, there bad soldiers. Only bad generals. <laughs> Good. I have another uh, I have another question that uh, is really where we started our conversation and uh, you told yeah. me that in the beginning of your career, uh, you, you found out that you would develop very good recommendations, but you found that it was difficult to get companies and people to implement them. And of course, uh, I find the same thing uh, both with companies and with individuals, especially one called Michael Roach, that uh, you know, I come up with a great program for them. Uh, I come up with great suggestions for them. And then when I come back in six months, I find out that nothing has been implemented. 
So I, I wondered, uh, since this has been a big part of your life's work, I think maybe it's the last thing I would like to ask, is that do you have any really good suggestions uh, from your viewpoint of many years of experience, uh, how do we get uh, companies to implement what we suggest? How do we get individuals to implement what we suggest? And how do we get ourselves to, in, to implement what we suggest? Okay, I, a very good question. I've been struggling with it for a long time, Michael. And here is my answer. At the beginning of my career, I will go work with a company very, very hard, change the culture, create the system. They were so successful. The president of a company, which was a division of a larger company, he was so successful, he got promoted. And a new president was sent in, and in three months, he destroyed everything that they built for three years. <laughs> in three months, he just stop this, stop that, up, 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 back to, you know, Back to work. I got very depressed. I said, oh my God, what did I waste my three years of my life on? You know, I'm a failure. I, I thought I'm a failure. Then a good friend of mine, a doctor, medical doctor, looked at me and he said, Ichak, all my patients die. <laughs> my goal is not to prevent death. My goal is to prolong life. Nice. Wow, that changed my orientation. I'm not trying to make my system permanent for the next 2,000 years. It is going to fail. Because change by nature is destructive. By nature is destructive. Whatever system you build, the change will change it. And it's going to die. It's going to die. Eventually, I go to companies that have been my clients for 20 years, and I find out is the ruins of Inca. There are some signs of it here and there, but it, it did not. So my quality call, call now is how to prolong life, how to prolong the methodology. And this is what they developed, that I train the people inside the company to practice the methodology and to be the leaders of the methodology, to teach the methodology, to be the teachers. I call them agents of change. They are the change leaders inside the company because as long as you come from the outside, you come once a month or twice a month. It needs to be ingrained. And then I have to make them come to my conventions and to keep in touch with us because they can get co-opted and they lose their capability to rechange. So as long as the inside people inside the company that we train and certified are members of the Jesus family and they come to our colloquia and they participate in our video sessions, and we discuss problems, and we are constantly learning, I can prolong the life of the organization with a methodology. As long as the moment they stop coming, it, it is now on the down curve and it's going to die. I cannot get it. How do I start it to be implemented? Next question. How do I get them to even accept the methodology to start with? There are two reasons why people change, in my judgment. One, because they're in pain, or one, because they have a change in values, in philosophy. I would say 90% of people that come to me is because they're in pain. 5% mm -hmm. is because they read my book and they got excited to manage the book. But it's only 10%. When they come with pain, I have to make the pain realized and put it on the table, not to run away from it. It's called fear. Face your fears. Face your fears. Face your problem. I make them face the problems. We have a three-day, we don't start any company unless we have a three-day syndic. Syndic is when we get all the shakers and movers of the company in the room and to a very systematic, very disciplined way, they disclose all the problems and put it on the table. And now all at once we realize nobody can solve these problems alone. I even ask them, how many of these problems can any individual solve in the company? Zero. How many of these problems, if I had a magic pill and you all work together and stop attacking each other and accusing each other, but actually accusing the problem, instead of a manager chasing 10 problems, 
We should have 10 managers chasing one problem at a time. How many of these problems can you solve? All. So I tell them the problem is not what you are telling me. The problem is you. <laughs> you are not working together. You are not working together. So are you willing to learn how to work together? And that's how we start. Trying to eliminate their pain. And now what the danger is, you might eliminate the pain, then they say, thank you very much. So you create a new pain every time. <laughs> not, not artificially, because when you solve one problem, you're creating the next problem. And the next problem creates the next problem. So there's always going to be something, which means a bigger problem. As you solve a small problem, a bigger problem, a bigger problem. So I try all the time make them grow, 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 grow. You were a regional company, now you're a national company. Now you want to be an international company. Now you want to be a global company. Now you want to be a multidisciplinary company. All the time growing. As long as you want to grow, they keep going. Cool. My question to you, and my turn, I think. My question to you. <laughs> How do you help people define their purpose in life? That is really your question from your list, which I like. So I'm no. In my case, I tell them that I tell them with a the, with the pen. The purpose is what you do for others. So you have to identify who are those others. Who are those others? Now, people say, okay, my purpose is to make my company successful. So, okay, what is the purpose of the company? Who are the others that the company is supposed to serve? Oh, sorry, one moment. Hello? Hello? No, no, you're still, you're still in program. I am in just minutes, for favor. So, uh, what is the purpose of a company? To serve whom? He says, clients. Who are the clients? Usually the mistake is to look at the people that pay you. <laughs> They're not the clients. Who needs you? Who needs you? I was consulting for the Los Angeles Department of Children's Services, social workers that are supposed to help abused children, and ask them, who is your client? Whom are you trying to satisfy? I was shocked. They started talking about the government in Sacramento, the government, you know, the Department of Social Welfare, where the money comes from. And I said, that is the wrong client. I went to the street, picked up a kid, took him by hand inside the room and say, here is the client. <laughs> Who needs you? Who needs you? And I think, find making them realize that our problem, our, our goal is to satisfy needs. And including our own needs. I have a needs too. And we satisfy my needs. So that brings the balance between me and serving others. Not only serving, but serving others. And that brings you to the Buddhist. When the Buddhist says, thank you for, I, I thank you for letting me serve you. Mm. Why? Because in serving other, you're fulfilling your mission. And in fulfilling your mission, you serve yourself. That's why actors bow in front of an audience. <laughs> beginning and beginning. At the beginning is to say, Thank you for allowing me to be myself. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to serve you. Yeah. But serving others is the purpose in life. I think uh, we found the same thing. Uh, I can remember uh, we gave a talk in uh, Norway and a young man asked me, uh, you know, I would, can you use your business method in your personal life. And I said, well, what do you want in your personal life? And he said, well, I'm looking for a wife. Can you use your business method to, to find a wife and to have a happy marriage? So our, our business method is basically four steps to plant a seed. First one, decide what you want. Uh, second one, find someone else who wants the same thing. Thirdly, help them get that thing. And then fourthly, just think about how fun it is to help other people and to serve other people and and how this brings you the things that you want for yourself so you know i i left norway i, I didn't go back uh for a year in the meantime he 
he actually tried these four steps and uh, he actually decided to go to a nursing home and to choose an elderly lady and he took her out to the movies every week and then you know he said that's how I planted my seeds Geshe Michael and I got a beautiful wife and then my friends started asking me you know where did you find her what was the nightclub uh, what was the website and he said no it was the nursing home and they said oh she looks so young and then he said no no you don't understand I went to the nursing home I helped an elderly lady I took her out to the movies every every week and because of that I planted seeds and I met my wife and, and we believe the wife is like the pen uh, it's coming from seeds in the person's mind from serving other people uh, then a year later he sent me a a video it was a two-minute video uh, that's being played on Norwegian television every week and the government of Norway and one of the large telecoms uh, they will actually pay for the tickets uh, if a young person goes to a nursing home and takes a, a, an elderly person out to the movies then the, the, the government and the telecom they will pay for both tickets and apparently this came about through this young man uh, his, he started uh, doing this himself his friends started trying it his friends friends started trying it and then it became some kind of virus in Norwegian society that when young men and women want to find a partner they go to the nursing home to help somebody so I, I feel like uh, this is a way that people can find a purpose also I think uh, the ultimate purpose in life is to help other people but even if you wanted to be selfish even if you just wanted to take care of yourself and you weren't interested in taking other people uh, I think uh, the only method to take care of yourself is to plant a seed by taking care of someone else so you can't get out of it you have to end up helping other people but you know Michael I want to qualify the word helping other people I found out that when I help people that really do not want to be helped, I'm hated. As a matter of fact, there is a Chinese expression, why do you hate me? I did not help you. I only help, <laughs> I only help people that want to be helped. I want to be sure that first of all, do you really want to be helped? Do you really, which means, do you really want to change? Or do you just want to pay me for something? You know, many, many people want to change as long as they don't have to change. They want to change, they don't have to change. I avoid them. I learn my lesson. I avoid them. I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting my love. I'm wasting my life. You know what? When you're ready, call me. <laughs> yeah, good. I think we should stop now because we said yeah. we're going to stop an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. I was really worried about how this is going to go, but for me, it went very well, and I'm very, very, very happy that we had it. Thank you, Yelena, for thinking about it and organizing it. I think it was a great, and we should repeat it again. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Dr. Dizis, and I really had a good time, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about you and about your system, and it's going to help me as a teacher, and thank you for doing it, and I hope we can do it again. Thank you, Elena, for doing it also. Absolutely. You, for me, it was a big honor to do that because I have a great experience for several years uh, work with Dr. Adizis and study the methodology and use the methodology, especially uh, with my family and with my business partners. And now I'm studying with Geshe Michael Roach in his college. And I see how my environment is changing and how people around uh, me and around the uh, trainings which is we're doing here in Russia and Moscow getting way more interesting how we can always balance philosophy business and personal insights thank you so hat and we will see you soon okay thank you thank you dr. Dizis <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>